let's take a look at energy. So to begin with, it turns out that energy is kind of hard to introduce. Um, you've probably seen it before or heard it mentioned before in biology and chemistry, but it's difficult to say exactly what it is. Um, you're probably told that it's in sunlight and it's in glucose somehow and it's in ATP and it exists in chemical bonds and it, hot gases have energy. But what is energy? Well, one definition would be that it's the ability of an object to change itself or the world around it. Which is a little fuzzy, honestly. Um, like, that doesn't really tell us what it is, right? Another definition is that it's the ability to do work. Okay, that's fewer words, that's nice. But then you got to ask, well, what's work? We don't know what work is. What, what does that mean? So we could try to go to the root of the word and Energy comes from a Greek root, energeia, uh, which means activity or work within. Okay, that doesn't really help that much. But at the end of the day, what energy is, is it's a useful idea. It's a useful idea which helps us to notice patterns and natural laws. And in particular, the natural law that energy helps us to use is the conservation of of energy, which is something that you may have encountered before and something that we will definitely use later on. But the last thing I want to say about energy before we start talking about the details is that energy is not an intuitive idea like speed or force. It's not something that we can point to and say, hey, that's energy. But it's a new idea and we kind of have to build it from scratch in physics. So let's try that. When we talk about energy, we usually talk about it coming in different forms or types or categories or kinds. And we're going to split energy into these three major categories, and then there's going to be categories within those. But one of the major categories is kinetic energy. This is the energy that's associated with the motion of an object. Another big category is going to be potential energy. And a little tricky to define, but this is the energy that's associated with the locations of objects and the arrangements of objects. Often it's referred to as the stored energy. And there's many different types or kinds of potential energy. There's gravitational potential energy, which we will use a lot in this class. Uh, then there's spring or elastic potential energy, which we will also use. And then there's electric potential energy, which we will see later on. There's chemical potential energy, which you deal with a lot in chemistry. There's nuclear potential energy, uh, which we'll see later. So there's many different types of this potential energy. Uh, another big category is thermal energy. Thermal energy is the energy associated with the motion of individual molecules. So it's kind of tiny kinetic energy. It's molecular level kinetic energy. And that's a big deal in chemistry, and we'll see it in thermal physics as well. Now, energy is usually represented with a capital letter E. That's the symbol for it. And the unit of energy, the SI unit of energy, is the joule, which is represented with a capital J. And the joule can be related to fundamental SI units, like kilograms, meters, seconds, and so on. Uh, but we will do that in a little bit. Also, energy is a scalar. It does not have direction. It only has magnitude. Now let's look a little bit more closely at kinetic energy. So I said before that kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion of an object. The symbol that we use for kinetic energy is either E with a little K next to it or capital KE. I'll tend to use E with a little K. And Kinetic energy has an equation associated with it. I'll write it down here. EK equals one-half mv squared. And just to define everything, m is the mass of the object. V is the speed of the object. So if we look at this, if we have an object which has a velocity of zero, so an object which is not moving, then if you look at this equation, that means that it has no kinetic energy. Its kinetic energy is zero joules. So if it's not moving, 
it has no kinetic energy. If the object has a large velocity, if its V is big, then its kinetic energy would be big. Also, we can see that if V keeps increasing, then the kinetic energy will keep increasing. So let's look at a little comparison. Let's say that we have two objects with the same mass. One's moving slow and one's moving fast. Well, which one would have the most kinetic energy? Well, if kinetic energy is one-half mv squared, the one with the larger speed, the one moving faster, will have more kinetic energy. All right. If you look at the equation, you can also see that the mass is going to have an effect on kinetic energy. If you have more mass, you also have more kinetic energy. So let's compare two situations. Let's say we have two objects moving at the same speed, but one has more mass than the other one. Well, which one would have more kinetic energy? Well, though they're moving at the same speed, the one with more mass will have more kinetic energy. All right. Another thing to notice is that kinetic energy cannot be negative. Look at that equation, 1 half mv squared. M cannot be negative. And if you square something, if you square the speed, speed squared can't be a negative number unless you have an imaginary speed, but that would be very strange. So kinetic energy has to be either zero or positive. It cannot be negative. Let's take a look at the units real quick. Well, kinetic energy has to have units of joules. And let's see what units we get from the other side. Well, 1 half mv squared. Well, m brings units of kilograms. V, the speed, has units of meters per second, and that's squared. So if we do the algebra, a joule is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. That's what a joule is in terms of fundamental SI units. Now let's take a look at gravitational potential energy. And this is the energy stored when an object is at a certain location in a gravitational field which is not really the clearest definition. Uh, I'm going to define it a different way, which is less exact, but maybe more useful. The gravitational potential energy can also be thought of as the energy stored in a system when an object is at a certain height. Now that's not perfect, and we'll see what difficulties we have with that definition later, but it'll work for now. Uh, gravitational potential energy can be represented with the symbol E GP, or sometimes GPE, like that. Uh, and I'm going to write down an equation for gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is equal to MGH. Now this is not a great or perfect uh, equation. It only works near the surface of the Earth. The M in the equation is the mass of the object that's at a certain height. G is the acceleration due to gravity. However, it's the acceleration due to gravity without any direction information. It's the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. So in other words, it's not 9.8 meters per second squared downward, which would go into this equation. It's just 9.8 meters per second squared. H is the height of the object, which if you start thinking a little deeply about it, is not well-defined. Where are we measuring the height from? Well, anyway, we'll worry about that later. Before we do that, um, let's think about the units. So the units of energy have to be joules, and if we take mgh and get the units out of that, we have units of kilograms from the mass, meters per second squared from g, and m from the height, which if we combine, then we see that a joule is equal to a kilogram meters squared per second squared, which is what we got from kinetic energy. So that's reassuring. A joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared, no matter if it's kinetic energy or potential energy. Now let's go back to the height. How do we measure the height? And to think about why this might be a difficult idea, let's, let's draw a little diagram. Let's say there's a cliff here that's 10 meters tall, and then there's a ball that's 2 meters above the top of the cliff. Well, what's the height of that object? Is it 2 meters in height? Or is it 12 meters in height? Or is it whatever the distance is to the center of the Earth? How are we measuring the height here? Where are we starting? Where are we measuring it from? What's our reference point? Well, in a problem, either it will be very obvious 
how you should measure the height, or you'll be told where, you'll, where you should measure the height from. But later on, what we will see is that when problem solving, you'll be able to decide where, where to measure the height from. And as long as you're consistent and you measure the height of the object from the same position, the same reference point throughout the whole problem, everything will work out. We'll see that in a little more detail later on. I also want to point out that there are different ways to represent the gravitational potential energy. Uh, they're slightly more complicated, uh, which we'll encounter later on. But for now, gravitational potential energy equal to mgh will be fine as long as we stay near the surface of the Earth. The last kind of energy that we'll look at is spring, or elastic, potential energy. And this is the energy stored in a stretched or compressed spring, or an elastic object. Today we'll focus mainly on springs. And the equation to find the spring or elastic potential energy is this. ESP, that's our symbol for spring potential energy, is equal to 1 half K delta X squared. And let's define all these things. K right there is a constant. It's the spring constant. And each spring has a different spring constant. Um, so if you have a bed spring, that would have one spring constant. If you get the spring that's holding up your garage door, that has a different spring constant. If you get a spring out of a watch, that has a different spring constant. And it has units of newtons per meter. And one way that you can think about it is that a high value of your spring constant corresponds to a stiff spring. And a low value of the spring constant corresponds to a loose spring. This delta x refers to the displacement of the spring from its equilibrium position. And I'll draw a couple pictures to show you what I mean. Let's imagine that we have a block attached to a spring. And if the spring is in equilibrium, so it's not stretched and not compressed, then it's at equilibrium. And then if it's at equilibrium, delta x equals zero. And in that situation, the spring potential energy is equal to zero joules. There's no energy stored in the spring because it's at its equilibrium position. Now let's say that we compress the spring a little bit. We move the spring so that it's bunched up, compressed. In that situation, now the object has been moved away from its equilibrium position. It's some displacement from the equilibrium. And here it's been moved to the left. So let's say that that's a displacement that's negative. So the displacement is less than zero meters. Well, now there is some spring potential energy in that spring. There's some energy stored in the spring because it's been compressed. And if we stretch the spring in this situation, then again, the spring has been moved from its equilibrium position. It's been stretched out to some displacement. So it has spring potential energy in it. And then the last thing we'll do is look at the units of this in the spring potential energy equation. So let's see, 1 half kx squared. The spring potential energy has to have units of joules. That 1 half constant, that has no units. K has units of newtons per meter. And then the displacement has units of meters, and that's squared. So if we bring all that together, a joule, it says, is equal to a newton times a meter. OK, well, there's another interesting idea. A joule is equal to a newton times a meter. Those are two units we've seen before. But a newton can be broken down even further. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So let's replace the newton with kilogram meter per second squared. And then we see that a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared, just like we expected and like we found with the other types of energy.